Polly hadn't been with us long enough yet to pretend to be impervious to the sincere flattery of people gorging themselves on the stuff you had made. He rubbed his face with his sugary hand to disguise the grin and went off to load up a plate and shout for Mary to take it out front. I was tempted not to admit when I went on break, but I was having to do enough lying just plugging through my days and nights and didn't want to get too used to it. It was like I didn't want to forget the difference between daylight and nighttime, and both my funny eyes and my funny new life and undead style seemed to be prodding me relentlessly in that direction. Not funny. My sunshine self, my tree self, my dear self, didn't we outnumber the dark self? My hands patted the two pockets that contained the knife and the seal, leaving two more smudges on my apron. I took the apron off and washed my hands and made myself a cup of tea and went out front. Pat had either come back or was still there. Polly's piled up plate two and a half hours ago hadn't been enough. He was now eating lemon lust pastry bars and killer zebras. Any normal human ought to have a gut he'd have to carry around on a wheelbarrow the, the way he ate. This had crossed my mind once or twice before, being many years acquainted with Pat's eating habits. But he was SOF, you know, so he got a lot of exercise and had a high metabolism rate. I wondered again what kind of demon he was. If he was a rubber foot, which came in blue sometimes, he could walk up walls, for example, which must burn a lot of calories. I nodded to him and went out to sit on the wall of Mrs. Bialski's flower bed. The sun was shining. He followed me. Listen to the news last night, he said. I was making it, I thought. I suppressed a shudder. No. One killed and free missing in no town, he said. The one killed is confirmed sucker. You can't be sure this soon that the other three are anything but missing, I said. Maybe they ran away. Pat looked at me. They may have run away from something else, I said, that had nothing to do with vampires. The moon may be one of Sunshine's killer zebras, but I doubt it, said Pat. A lot of people saw these four hanging around together earlier in the evening. I didn't say anything. Four is a lot for one night, even in no town. I still didn't say anything. We'd like you to come round this afternoon and have another stroll for a few cosmels, said Pat. I don't get off till ten tonight. We'll wait, Pat said grimly. There's one little snag. Emile doesn't want to do it. She says you tried it on your own a few days ago and it took you away somewhere. She said she thought you'd died. Now why would you want to try it on your own, I wonder? Why do you think, I said, looking at him steadily. The shadows on his face lay plain and clean. I slid a little further into my strange seeing. These shadows had a slightly rougher textured quality I was beginning to guess meant part blood. I'd seen it in Maud's face first, but Emil had it too, and in Pat's case this not quite human aspect was distinctly blue. But the shadows said there was no deceit beyond the basic subterfuge of passing for pure blood human. Pat was who he said he was and believed what he said he believed. I want to find these guys too, I said. An SOF barding your par begging your pardon makes me nervous. Pat sighed and rubbed his head with his hand, making his short SOF norm hair stand on end. Look, kiddo, I know all the usual complaints about SOF, and I agree with most of them. He saw me looking at his hair and smiled a little. So I don't happen to mind the hair in the uniform. That's not a crime, is it? But we can protect you better at SOF HQ than you can protect yourself anywhere else. What if what you were tracking had noticed you were searching for it the other day? You think you could have got back out fast enough for it not to follow you home? The fact that Emil is still alive proves that it didn't notice, but I think that was dumb luck. Nobody has ever lived a long, happy life depending on dumb luck, and depending on any kind of luck is as good as tearing your own throat out when you're messing with suckers. I don't care what extra powers you got, sunshine. I swallowed. Did you say all that to Emil? You bet I did, babe, and more besides. She is, after all, on our payroll and subject to our rules. You aren't. Yet. Although I've thought about it, but SOF doesn't pay so good, and generally we have to blackmail people like you and Emil, to put it bluntly. Not to mention figuring out what the official description of what we wanted you for would be. I could probably tie you up in a big knot of top-secret intelligence bureaucracy. We've got powers to compel ordinary citizens in certain circumstances. Did you know that? and we could make these the right kind of circumstances, never fear. But it would take too long, and I suspect it would make you honorary. We need you too badly to risk pissing you off if we can get you any other way. By the way, you were planning on coming to us with anything you found on the other end of Emil's Cosmos, weren't you? 
You don't have any noble suicidal plans to take these suckers on by yourself, do you? Tell me you are not that stupid. I said with perfect honesty, I have no intention of trying to take these suckers on by myself, no. Pat looked at me with a slight frown. Why doesn't that sound as reassuring as it should? I gazed back at him as innocently as I could. He sighed. Never mind, we'll see you at ten tonight. In fact, I'll come by myself at closing. I'm not going to sneak out the back way and go home if I've told you I'll come, I said annoyed. You haven't actually said you will come, said Pat calmly, and I don't want you walking around by yourself at that hour in case Bozo gets wise between now and then. This was a little too near, a little too much of the truth. Bozo, I said carefully, do you have a name? Have we ever had a name, said Pat? You find them and you stake them and then you burn them to be sure, but we're obviously chasing a master vampire here, and it's easier if we call him something. Assuming it's a him, which they usually are, so we're calling him Bozo. So are you saying you'll be waiting for me at 10 tonight then? But if Emil... I'll tell her you're coming anyway, and we've got that Cosmel saved, and we can do it without her if we have to. She can either come be part of the safety net or sit at home waiting for really bad news and be hauled over the carpet and messily fired later on. What sweethearts you SOFs are, I said. There was no humor at all in Pat's face when he replied, Yeah, but we're real devoted to the idea of keeping the live alive. What did you do to your chin and your arm? Is that from when you fell out of a mule's chair? Must be, I said. I don't remember that well. It was a fairly ordinary day at the coffee house. We had one crazy wanderin' off the street who wanted to tell all of us that the end of the world was coming. He had an interesting variant of the standard format. In his reading, the moon was going to be moved in front of the sun and kept there to create a permanent eclipse while the creatures of dark took over down here. The moon would be held in place by the something a meter invented by the creatures of dark and which they were presently perfecting. He said creatures of dark, not vampires. I suppose I was in a twitchy mood anyway, but I didn't like this. There are lots of creatures of the dark, but I would have said that except for vampires, none of them is bright enough to invent a something a meter. So why didn't he say vampires? He did say 18 months tops before the eclipse began. It was a good thing he hadn't watched in a while and raved like a loony, or some of us might have believed him. I told myself his story would make a good novel. It would sure make a better novel than it would a reality. Mel got rid of him. Mel goes all good old boy amiable and eases them out the door, and the thing about it is that when Mel does it, they don't come back. The only times we've ever had to call the cops is when Mel hasn't been there. Ranting crazies make Charlie nervous. Because this is Old Town, we get a fair number of crazies. Hell, we feed most of them out the side door, but not so many of them rant. Charlie can sue the customer and determine to pick a fight when Mel would just throw him out the first time he swore at one of the waitresses, and I'd back Mel against most brawlers, but taking them on their own terms isn't a good way to avoid calling the cops. Sometimes I think more throwing out would be a good thing. We have enough customers. We don't need to put up with the flaming assholes. But Charlie's is Charlie's because of Charlie, which is probably a good thing, too. But Mel is the one who deals with the, no the noisy nutters, if there's ever a Mel's, it will be racier, and Charlie's will have to hire a bouncer with a degree in counseling. This crazy came in during the lull between the late afternoon muffin and scone crowd and the early supper eaters, so there weren't too many people around. Mrs. Bialski was there, and I didn't like the way she listened to him either. It seemed to me she was having some of the same thoughts I was. Maybe she was just thinking about full moons. The crazy hadn't mentioned what was going to happen about the moon's phases. He must not be aware himself. Hey, little live entertainment for slack time, Mel said to me. This one missed the mark. Okay, next time I'll get jugglers. I smiled because he wanted me to, but I noticed he was rubbing one of his tattoos, the hourglass one, that you can't see which way the sand is running. It's a charm about not running out of time. He'd been listening to the crazy too. I couldn't see into the shadows on Mel's face. They flickered less than some, but the red edges were more dazzling as if to make up for this. I didn't know if I couldn't see past the dazzle because I couldn't, couldn't, or because I didn't want to. If I didn't want to, what was it I was afraid I was going to be seeing? By 10 o'clock I was tired and I wanted to go home and go to bed. I had a lot of sleep to catch up on. The last thing I wanted to do was slope off the SOFHQ and plug into another live socket and fry my brains some more. 
But when Kyoko came into the bakery to tell me Pat was in front waiting for me, I didn't duck out the back door, even though I hadn't promised. I may have given the cinnamon roll sponge a few more vicious stirs than it needed, but then I threw my apron into the laundry, washed off the worst of the day's spatters and stains, and went to meet my fate. I paused briefly under the doorway. A few days ago, I'd tacked up a string over the lintel so I could stuff some of Mom's charms up there. They balanced on the narrow lintel edge and were kept from pitching over by the string. She hadn't said anything, but then we'd never discussed the fact that she was coming into the bakery when I wasn't there. She rarely crossed the threshold when I was and leaving charms roundabout. Well, so the glove compartment was full, or she was wearing me down, and they wouldn't last long trying to protect the doorway that had people coming and going through it all the time, but at least they could keep their eyes, so to speak, on me when I was there, and while they still had what in charms passes for eyes. The funny thing was that I'd begun to feel them there and kind of didn't mind. I've said that charms usually rub me the wrong way, like a rash or a colicky baby living in the spare bedroom whose mom sleeps deeper than you do. And when I stood under the doorway for a moment, I felt their, well, their goodwill. I'm not sure it was any stronger than that, soaking in. I felt like a baba soaking up rum, or possibly chopped peculiarly vegetables vinegar. I shook my head to make the opalescent chain swish over my skin and patted my, and patted my pockets. Pat and I walked over to my surprise. I kind of want to know if there's anyone close enough to make a pass at you, said Pat. Hope you got a table knife in your pocket. Very funny, I said. Shouldn't be necessary, said Pat unfazed. I got a few of ours skulking in the shadows, ready to race to our rescue. This was not comforting, not so much because a vampire could have struck in from nowhere and killed us both before any human defender had done any more than take a deep breath and wonder if there was a problem, but because of what SOF didn't know about my extracurricular activities. I didn't want SOF watching me that closely, and I didn't like their spending that kind of expensive human time on me. You sound like you're taking this very seriously. You betcha. Why, you haven't got any proof yet that what Emil and I are doing is anything but psycho-doodling? Pat was silent a moment and then gave a heavy sigh. You know, Sunshine, you're a pain to work with. You think too much. Have you read anything about the little black boxes that are supposed to register other activity called tickers? Yeah, they don't work. Actually, they work pretty well. The problem is that there is a larger number of unregistered part bloods than the general, in the general pop than anyone wants to talk about. Well, gosh, isn't that surprising? And the tickers keep getting confused or, you know, sabotaged. It's been a real bad problem in SOF for some reason. Can't imagine why. There's ways around this problem, however, once you all know you're reading off the same page. So we got some tickers that give us pretty good readings once we figured out how to set them up. And I'll tell you that a couple we got down in No-Town about fused their chips when you did your locating trick for us a few days ago. And they did it again that, that afternoon when it turns out you were committing your felony with a meal. Felony, my ass, I said. Attempting to consort with an enemy alien is a felony, my pretty darling, and all others are enemy aliens. It's not one of those rules anyone wants to pursue too closely, but it has its uses. And trying to locate them is near enough to trying to consort with them for me. Anyway, we've never had readings like these readings. What you're up to may be psychodoodlings, all right, but they're great big strong psychodoodlings, and we're beginning to hope you may be the best chance we've seen in years, and not another one of my over-optimistic bad calls. I considered having a nervous breakdown on the spot. I probably could have thrown a good one, too, about how I couldn't take the strain that my life had crashed and burned those two nights I went missing by the lake, and all Pat and SOF were doing now was stamping out the ashes, and oh, by the way, if you have an axe handy, I'll run mad with it now and get it over with, since my jeans are being slower off the mark than I've been expecting, since I figured it out two months or whatever ago. And by the way, that was SOF's doing too, you guys in your sidelong, suggestive little chats. While half my brain was considering the nervous breakdown recourse, the other half was considering whether maybe I could locate Bo well enough and then let SOF handle it. Con and I wouldn't have to go within miles, vampire miles or human miles of no town. We could sit at home drinking champagne and waiting for the headlines. New Arcadia SOF division eliminates major vampire lair and destroys its master. Our correspondent, blah, blah, blah. 
My imagination wanted most important strikes since Voodoo Wars, but it wouldn't be. It felt global to me because it was my life on the line. But it wasn't going to happen that way. I didn't even know why, not to be able to explain it. But I could feel it, like you feel a stomach ache or a cold coming on, or somebody's eyes staring a hole in your back. SRF could go in and mess things up for a little while, stake a few young vampires, and maybe wreck Bo's immediate plans. But maybe this was something else I was learning to see in the shadows. Maybe it was from traveling through Nowheresville or walking Khan's short ways last night when I was somewhere else. Watching my reality stream by, finding out there are other places with other rules. I was beginning to understand how the connections in the vampire world really aren't like our human connections in our human world. I was tethered to Khan as absolutely as he had been shackled to the wall of the house beside the lake, and he and Bo had a bond that required one of them to be the cause of the destruction of the other one. I guess now that this was as natural a situation to a vampire as making cinnamon rolls was to me. I wondered what happened if a vampire involved in one of these lethal packs did the vampire equivalent of falling under a bus. Did the other one, foiled of catharsis, spin off into the void instead? The really nasty void, that is, which could explain why it was so God's bloody awful a place to visit. He could have warned me, I thought. Khan could have said something that second morning by the lake. Would it have occurred to him? No. Besides, what was he going to say? Die now or later? That had been the choice all along, and as far as my situation now being the mere sad inevitable result of my being in the wrong place at the wrong time, grow up, sunshine, Bo would be just a tiny bit irritated with me personally, having not only escaped but taken his prize prisoner with me. What had kept me alive so far, my scorned and ignored magic handling talent, my reluctant and harrowing alliance with Khan, was also what was causing the bond. Ordinary mortals don't get bound up in ceremonial duels to the death with master vampires, but ordinary mortals don't survive introductory vampire counter encounters either. I cast back to that second morning at the lake and thought he did warn me, or remind me. I just didn't hear it. Why should I? And why should he think I needed warning? That we are both gone will mean that something truly extraordinary has happened, and it almost certainly has something to do with you, as it does, does it not? and that therefore something important about you was overlooked. And Bo will like that even less than he would have liked the straightforward escape of an ordinary human prisoner. He will order his folk to follow. We must not make it easy for them. I was the one who'd assumed the time limitations around Khan's annotations of our predicament. Recently, Khan had said, I knew what happened at the lake would not be the end, and it wasn't like I'd been surprised. Okay, what if, just as a matter of keeping our position clear here, what if we managed to off bow now? What new chains of vengeance and retaliation would we have forged instead? I wanted to laugh, but I didn't want to come up with a likely story to explain to Pat what I was finding to laugh at, unless I wanted to make the laughter hysterical as a lead-in to my nervous breakdown. But I didn't. I wanted to find Bo and get on with it. Whatever happened next, whatever. I would think about whatever if there was a tomorrow to think about it in. Right now, today was enough, like getting away from the lake alive had been enough. If Emile's Cosmel was Bo and I could trace it, and SOF could offer some protection from being traced back, then I'd risk doing it with SOF. I wanted to find Bo, and hadn't I just been saying there was a bond between Bo and me as well? Big, ugly, mega yuck. What I didn't want was to get sucked in again and maybe somehow this time pop out on top of Bo. As things I couldn't bear to think about went, this was very high on the list. My sunshine self, my tree self, my dear self, didn't we outnumber the dark self? What I had to figure out fast was if there was going to be a way I could make a mark, leave a clue, carry some bad void token away with me that Khan and I could follow or intercept better or faster than SOF could. There had been kind of a lot going on, and I hadn't sorted what I had found, or half found, or begun to find in Emile's living room. If sorting was a possibility, Emile had been afraid I'd died. No, I'd figure it out. I had to. 
Did the tickers do anything but register activity? Could they define it? They'd pick up Con and me too when we started going somewhere, wouldn't they? If. Supposing our rough human world guesses were right and what we all wanted was in no town, but if SOF was now going to start keeping a closer watch on me, were they going to plant a ticker near Yolandi's house? Oh gods, could she disable a SOF ticker? Emil, looking subdued, was waiting in Pat's office with Jesse and Theo. She got up from her chair and put her arms around me. I hugged her back and we stared at each other a moment. I guess these guys worked you over so the bruises don't show, I said. Which is more than can be said for you, said Emil, touching my jaw gently. I got that doing chin-ups on the top of and I said, let's get on with this, can we? I want to go home and go to bed. Four in the morning is already soon. Pat's comm box was on, and the saved Cosmel winked at us as soon as he touched the screen. Even before plugging into the live connection, it looked evil to me. The flickering print seemed to have a kind of bulgy red edge, so that it looked like tiny, tiny scarlet mouths howling behind every letter of every word. Ready, said Pat. I sat down and put my hands on the keyboard like I was going to do some perfectly ordinary comm thing. Tap a few keys, see what the headlines were on the dark line. Ready, I said. He pressed the globe net button and the mail went live. I was almost sucked in after all. Hey, I didn't know what I was doing. Was there an apprenticeship for this? The globe net hadn't been around all that long, but magic handlers adapt pretty fast. They have to. If I'd been apprenticed, could I have learned how to trace a Cosmo? No. If this was something magic handlers now routinely did, SOF would have a division of magic handlers that did it. And they wouldn't be all over me like a cheap suit. I was going where no one had gone before and I wasn't having a good time. It was my talismans that helped me together, and in this world I felt them heat up, wow, like zero to a hundred and nothing flat, with the throttle all the way open, like a cold inert vampire being brought back to undeadness by a surprise drop-in guest. I guess there was a red hoop around my neck and over my breast now, and a red oval on each thigh. I hoped they wouldn't set my clothes on fire, which might be hard to explain as well as embarrassing. It was pretty excruciating. It was like being dragged forward and hauled backward simultaneously, as if I was living the moment when my divided loyalties ripped me apart and took off with their riven halves. Other space yawned, and while last night with Khan at the far end of the backcountry lane version, it had merely been remote and unearthly and nowhere I had any business being, tonight it was the bad one again, the shrieking maelstorm. If I went headfirst into this one, I wouldn't come out, except in small, messy pieces. But I was frisking on the boundary of dangerous territory for a purpose. Dimly through the inaudible den, I thought perhaps this is Bo's defense system. Okay, if I can find out where the defense system is, presumably I can find where what it's defending is. Or is that too human a logic? I tried to orient myself carefully, carefully, staying firmly seated on the chair in Pat's office, feeling my, tal feeling my talismans burning their variously shaped holes into my flesh. I wasn't the compass needle myself this time. That would have been too far in. I was trying to angle for a view so I could see where the compass needle pointed. There. And I was flung over backward with the chair and landed on the floor so hard the breath was knocked out of me. This was just as well because Pat's comm box exploded. Droplets of superheated flying goo rained down on me as well as tiny fragments of God's, knows, God's know what and larger pieces of plastic housing. There were a few half-muffled shouts of surprise and pain, and then there were a lot of alarm bells ringing. I was still struggling to get some breath back in my lungs when people started arriving. I had thought those were real alarm bells. They were. What looked like everybody at SOF headquarters poured into Pat's room, and there were more of them than you'd think for 10.30 at night. Once I could breathe again, I could tell the medic I wasn't hurt. There are medics on duty 24-7 at SOF HQ. Our tax blinks at work. Well, okay, lots of big corps have medics on duty, but few of them have combat patches. This one did. My shirt had got a little torn somehow, and the chain in the market made were visible. He gave me some burn cream for the latter, while he muttered something about the weird effects of a comm box blowout. Fortunately, it didn't seem to occur to him to suggest that there was something funny about my necklace. And I, and I shouldn't wear it. I didn't mention the hot spots I could feel on my thighs. I was glad still to have thighs. 